Welcome to this presentation about software security based on isolation. After the security part 3 about STM32 security features, I'd like to go on in more details about ways to create isolated environments on embedded targets and especially about TrustZone. First, I'd like to introduce the concept of isolation and what is it good for. Then I'll go through the means uh, of isolation that we have today on STM32 and introduce TrustZone, which is a new feature coming from ARM that is integrated on STM32 L5. At the end, we'll go through the development flow and also the C extension for TrustZone applications. Isolation concept. There is a color convention throughout this video. Uh, the secure project is color coded as green, the non secure as pink. The purpose of creating isolation barrier between the secure and user project is to protect the key secrets and assets. If hacker gains access to the user application, they will still be able to cause mischief in those regions, but they will not be able to access any resource that is behind the isolation barrier. They cannot compromise the key, they cannot bypass the authentication checks, for example. To achieve this level of isolation, there needs to be a support on a hardware level. There is no way to do this purely on a software basis. In a typical application scenario, when the microcontroller resets, it boots into the secure part of memory and it executes the secure boot. This is an immutable piece of firmware that checks integrity and authenticity of user application. And if everything is OK, the execution is passed to the user project. A second thing which is also very desirable is export some of the secure functionality to the user project. These are so-called legal API. An example of this can be, for example, crypto operations or uh, secure storage. And it's these interactions between the secure and user applications that are especially difficult and trust zones brings real benefit into this. One way to create these isolated environments is thanks to MPU and privilege and a non-privileged level of execution of Cortex Core. MPU is a core periphery that can create regions anywhere in the memory map. These regions can cover flash, SRAM, or even peripherals. The access to these regions can be allowed only to the core running with privileges, which means the non-secure application must run without these privileges all the time, which might cause issues in some cases. A second possible problem is that MPU is filtering transactions only close to the core and it does not cover other bus masters such as the GMA. So to work around this, the secure application must restrict access to the GMA configuration registers themselves, which in turn means the non-secure application cannot take the benefit of GMA streams. Another way uh, to create isolated environments is through firewall. So this is a proprietary SGE periphery that snoops uh, the bus transactions close to the flash and close to the SRAM. So this is below the bus metrics. The access to the protected regions is only possible once uh, the firewall is open. Once the firewall is closed and the non-secure application tries to execute or read the protected region, the firewall will detect it and it will generate a reset. The configuration of the region is uh, done by the secure application and so on, once it's finished, uh, it cannot be changed until the next reset. The big advantage of firewall compared to MPU uh, is that it covers also other bus masters such as uh, the DMA. 
There is very specific uh, procedure to open the firewall. Uh, the non-secure application uh, needs to jump to very specific uh, address and it is this well-defined entry point uh, that makes uh, the firewall secure. It's not possible for the non-secure to jump randomly inside the secure region. It has to go through this very well-defined entry point. Also, firewall has some constraints. Uh, first of all, uh, the interrupts must be disabled uh, by the non-secure application before uh, calling the legal API, before uh, opening uh, the firewall. The second constraint uh, is that uh, it's not possible to uh, protect or isolate peripherals. Uh, firewall only create regions in Flash or SRAM. Another mechanism for isolation is Secure Flash. This mechanism is in fact very simple. It's implemented on the level of Flash interface. So in the typical use case, the microcontroller after reset uh, boots into the secure part of Flash where the security parameters are configured and secure boot is executed. So this is immutable piece of code that checks the integrity and authenticity of the non-secure application. And if the check is passed, the flow of execution is passed to the non-secure. And at this point, the secure part of flash memory disappears from the memory map until the next reset. So the obvious constraint is uh, it's very difficult to have common interactions between the secure and non-secure only via the secure flash mechanism. All these interactions have to go through reset. So this might be feasible, for example, for secure firmware upgrade, which is a secure service, which is called rather rarely and uh, takes quite a long time on its own. But it's rather difficult to have services which are meant to be uh, called in a regular and frequent way. So this table summarizes uh, the isolation features with respect to different STM32 families. Uh, the secure, uh, secure memory, also called HGP, uh, is present on L5, H7, G0 and G4. MPU is uh, on every family except F0. Firewall is present on L0 and L4. And the new microcontroller STM32L5 has secure memory, MPU, and also trust zone, which is by far uh, the best solution to isolate uh, the secure and non-secure application. Trust zone introduction on STM32L5. Let's now have a look at Cortex-M33 and trust zone. Cortex-M33 is a part of ARMv8 architecture, which adds an extra security state of execution. When the core is running in secure state, it has access to all the resources in the microcontroller. On the other hand, uh, when the core is running in non-secure state, it has limited visibility of resources. And there is a great granularity in which uh, these resources can be restricted. This, of course, is a job of the secure application running in secure state to define the split between the secure and non-secure world. It's possible to restrict access to multiple regions in flash and RAM. It's possible to restrict access to individual peripherals, even also to individual GPIO pins. Some of the core registers, uh, some of the core peripherals are banked, which means uh, they exist in two instances, one for the secure state, the other one for non-secure. So there are two systicks, two vector tables, 
there are two MPUs and two stacks with two separate stack pointers. The state, which, state switch is uh, driven by hardware, which brings the benefit uh, of real-time execution, meaning there is low interrupt latency, low switching overhead, and the sw state switch is deterministic. So on the left, we see uh, the ARMv7 architecture that uh, we have currently on all other STM32 except L5. The core can run in two level of privileges. Handler mode uh, basically means uh, the core is running inside the interrupt service routine or running an exception. Thread mode is ARM term for running the background task. The exceptions or interrupts are always run with elevated privileges. Uh, the threat mode can be either privileged on or unprivileged depending on the software design. In the ARMv8, we add an extra security state, which is orthogonal. So we can have all the four combinations of privileged levels and secure states. Trust zone is based on transaction filtering on the internal bus. There are two levels of filter. The top one is close to the Cortex-M33 core. These are the attribution unit SAU and IDAU. The second level of filters is on the slave side, so close to the targets, which in this case is flash, RAM, external memories and also peripherals. The access rules of Trust Zone is, are rather complex and you can find more details about this in the security MOOC part 3. Here I'd like to just highlight that Trust Zone is not just about uh, new new core, it's also about the new specification of the internal bus, the AHB5, which is adding a sideband side signal which propagate the security states of the processor to the bus. This in fact allows uh, the protection controllers to filter these transactions based on the state of the core. The protection controllers are distributed around the chip. Uh, there is one inside the flash memory interface. There is also the GTZC uh, Global Trust Zone Controller, which is, which is filtering transactions to the RAM, external memories, and also some of the peripherals. Some of the more advanced peripherals uh, are capable to process the security uh, sideband signal on their own, and these are so-called trust zone aware. So global trust zone security controller, uh, it's an ST proprietary periphery that can be found on STM32L5. It uh, configures uh, the secure areas inside SRAM, external memories, and it also configures the security of uh, most of the peripherals. It also aggregates the illegal access uh, to, to the restricted regions. So if a non-secure application uh, running in a non-secure state tries to access uh, a secure region or secure periphery, the GTZC will gather the illegal access signal and it will generate uh, an interrupt towards the Cortex-M33 core. And then it's up to the secure application to handle this illegal access. Trust Zone architecture allows an easy integration of other bus masters such as the DMA. So the DMA is capable to generate secure or non-secure bus transactions based on the security configuration 
and this can be done on a level of individual DMA channels and also on the level of source and destination address for one particular channel. The security configuration is uh, performed through the DMA slave port uh, and this is typically done by the secure uh, application during the initialization phase. On Cortex-M33 there are two separate vector tables and each individual interrupt service routine can be assigned to either secure or non-secure weld. The assignment and also the priority management is configured by the secure application after boot. So on the example we have on the right, uh, the interrupt service routine for the UART and SPI is assigned to the non-secure weld, which means that when the periphery generates an interrupt request, uh, the core will execute this interrupt service routine in non-secure state. There are really no constraints on the security state switch. This can happen at any time, uh, either when the core is running in the thread, meaning the background tasks, or even when the core is running inside the interrupt service routine. The interrupt latency is slightly increased when switching from secure to non-secure. The reason for this uh, is there is some necessary cleanup of the core registers in order to in order not to leak some information to the non-secure application. So apart from the hardware-driven context safe of the core registers to the stack, there's also a register clearing which adds uh, couple of clock cycles to the standard 12. Uh, the same is true uh, even for the function calls uh, from secure to uh, non-secure. Even here the latency is slightly increased because the registers need to be cleared. Uh, in this particular case this is not hardware driven but the compiler adds an extra instructions that clear the core registers to zero. Trust zone development flow. The development flow with trust zone is also that is something new. Uh, the secure and the non-secure project are built uh, separately. Uh, they are often developed by different teams, possibly also by different companies. Uh, the secure project can optionally export some legal API to the non-secure. And in this case, the output of the build of secure project is a secure gateway library and the associated library headers. The non-secure project is then linked against this library. So the, obviously the order of build uh, is uh, secure project first, non-secure uh, as second. Secure project does require support for trust zone. Uh, it's necessary to use an extension to uh, the C language uh, to tell the compiler and linker uh, to use the special instructions that are specific to uh, state switch. Uh, on the other hand, non-secure project is unaware of security states and uh, linking against the secure gateway library is in fact the same like linking against any other type of library. Trust zone, interactions between the secure and non-secure application. So let's now have a look on the details of the security state switch uh, from the non-secure to the secure. So let's imagine the secure application exports a legal API. It exports a functionality uh, to decrypt some chunk of data that is provided by the non-secure. And by, do by doing this, uh, the decryption algorithm and also the key 
is not exposed to the non-secure application. So we start, uh, the non-secure uh, application starts by branching uh, into the non-secure callable region, which is already part of the secure memory. And it branch, it has to branch on a very specific instruction called the secure gate. And this is the well-defined entry point into the secure, secure world, and this is what makes it secure. If the non-secure application tries to jump anywhere else, except on SG inside the non-secure callable region, there will be a security fault and the secure application can handle this case. After, after the SG, uh, the app execution flow uh, will branch to the actual body of the decrypt function and when the function is finished, uh, the BXNS will pass the execution back to don't secure. So again, there is another state switch. So in, in fact, uh, you may ask what, why there are two regions, uh, the secure and the non-secure callable. Um, it's adding an extra level of uh, protection because the non-secure callable region is the only place uh, where the SG instruction can be executed. It cannot be uh, executed inside the secure region. So we have this very small, well-controlled uh, non-secure callable region, and this is the only valid entry point into the secure, secure world. So how do you actually do this uh, from the software point of view? Uh, let's say we have a function uh, inside the secure application and we uh, want to export it to the non-secure application. We simply add this intrinsic inside of, uh, in front of the function definition, uh, the CMSE underscore NS underscore entry. And this will tell uh, the compiler and the linker to use uh, to use these special instructions and it will tell a uh, linker to create uh, this veneer inside the non-secure callable region. So let's now look at the opposite direction. Let's imagine the secure application is calling a function inside the non-secure application. In, in fact, this happens at least once uh, in every application. So after the reset and initial uh, configuration of security parameters, uh, also after the secure boot, the flow of execution is passed to the non-secure application. In this very specific use case, we would not expect to ever come back to the secure application. But there are other use cases where this uh, might be necessary. Again, there is a new instructions, uh, BLN, BLNS, uh, BLXNS, uh, branch with link to non-secure. Uh, in fact, uh, when the execution of the function B is finished, uh, the execution is uh, passed back to the secure. And the small detail uh, is that even the return address is not exposed to the non-secure application. The link register contains some magic value and uh, the actual return address is, is hidden uh, and not visible uh, to the non-secure application. And again, how can we do this inside the secure application? How can we call a non-secure function? Uh, well, we first need to define uh, this function pointer of this special type, uh, function pointer underscore ns. Then we take the function pointer to the non-secure, uh, feed it as an input argument to the macro cmse underscore ns 
and so on. Then we typecast again to this special type def, and then we can call the function. So this is just uh, the special syntax of this language extension for ARMv8. Uh, the interesting fact is uh, that the function pointers are often initialized at, uh, at runtime. And the reason is uh, the dependency. Uh, we want to get rid of any uh, placement dependency of non-secure project on the secure one. So the secure application already knows uh, that it uh, will call some non-secure functions. However, it's not sure about the addresses. It's not sure about the placement of these functions. Uh, that's why uh, the secure project exports a legal API, which is called by the non-secure. And this is, this is the way uh, the non-secure application can share the information about uh, the actual placement of these function pointers. Conclusion. We have introduced all the existing isolation means on STM32, including MPU, firewall, secure memory and trust zone. We have also gone into quite a lot of details about the integration of Trust Zone into STM32 L5. At the end, we introduced the development flow and also the C language extension necessary for Trust Zone applications. Before we finish, I would like to point out to your attention some of the useful resources from ARM and also ST. On this landing page, you can find introduction to Trust Zone, uh, also a functional overview and more software oriented application notes. If you look for some specific details, I would suggest uh, searching in the reference uh, specifications and user manuals. I can also recommend to you AN5347 that details the Trust Zone features on STM32 L5. The AN5156 that introduces security on STM32 microcontrollers and also the reference manual for L5. I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for your attention.